All right, Jeff. Good How evening you? to you. I'm doing well. You said good evening to me and good morning to you, Jeff. <laughs> so you you have your breakfast and I'll start preparing my appetizer for my dinner. Nice to have you all. Okay. And uh, you are my fourth guest uh, speaker on this episode. And let me share this. Uh... Okay. Well, seriously, thank you for letting me be a part of your show. I've been hearing about it a lot, so it's great to, to meet you. Uh, you know, just to, to be in company of uh, celebrities like you, uh, I never dreamt of. Uh, I never even thought that I would ever do a, a podcast, podcast or whatever you call it. I'm a, absolutely a Gemba guy and uh, yeah. I, can, I dirty my hands and I miss my Gemba. But then uh, this is all destined. So I started the series, uh, Jeff, uh, and uh, market that I have not said implement. Okay. Okay. Now, implementation, you can take any path that you want. You can do the lean path, you will do the Toyota production uh, system, Toyota management system, you can do theory of constraint, you can do Six Sigma, you would take any path. All what I I bothered about since I started into this way back in 1997. I'm not getting into my biography unless, of course, you want to uh, direct a biopic on me. I, I don't mind that part of it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, all what I'm saying is that having initiated it and having organization having gained some, I mean, benefits at the initial stage. So suddenly, uh, we've just not been able to sustain it. Yes. So that's, uh, that's what, that was the series about. And I, I may not have another series because uh, I'm going to go on, whether it is 2022, 2023, somewhere, <laughs> somewhere, somebody will give me a magic uh, pill. Uh, and uh, whoever would like to use it can use it and just ensure that whatever you started, sustain it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So. Well, that's uh, very difficult. Sir, I wore this wedding ring 41 years ago and have sustained it for 41 years. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and it wasn't easy, was it? Uh, well, we had. Don't answer a... that. Don't, no, don't <laughs> answer that. I... That's not a fair question. Yeah. <laughs> no, uh, irrespective of where you are in the globe, we go through the same journey. Yeah. Okay? And the best part of the ring, sorry to take your time, is your time. The best part of the ring is whoever is outside wants to come inside the ring. Whoever is inside the ring wants to go outside the ring. Now, I don't know. Yeah. Why. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, uh, Jeff, here you are. President of Valley Creation Institute, and uh, I would jokingly said that I was very serious instead of putting dollars, why don't you put rupees? And I would love to have you across in India. And you're the regional partner, partner for Six Sigma Management Institute. Yes. Masters in statistics, Miami University, Bachelor of Science in Mechanical Engineering. I'm not going to ask you, why did you go from mechanical into statistics? I am not going to ask you that because my focus is different. Okay. And here you are. You are, uh, you are uh, as you were telling me, uh, one, uh, one amongst the 24 who are, who have the designation of certified Lean Six Sigma executive master black belt. And yes, your uh, coach, mentor, uh, teacher, whatever you uh, designate him as, is Dr. Michael J. Harry. And yes, he did that that's in right. 2015. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, I, I'm, that's getting covered, but then it's in 2015 that you got this certification. 
Right. Um, none right. other than Dr. Michael Harry. Great, sir. Uh, it's really uh, a divine wink, as I said, to have you on my show. Well, uh, as uh, we have put over there, uh, you started your career with uh, General Motors, 76, 1976, 34 years in G Aviation. You are now the regional partner for Six Sigma Management Institute and the Value Creation Institute from 2013. Uh, is that chronologically correct, sir? Yes, that's that's correct. And um, it's a long journey. It's just uh, it's a lot of uh, I'm very thankful for all of those experiences. Lots of people involved and in that. Today, I have a commitment from you that you're going to share all your experience with us. <laughs> and I OK, I intentionally did not use the word promise because promises can be broken. Come yes okay broken. right so here we go uh jeff uh, uh although it shows uh interaction but there will be less of interaction and uh, less of query from me i can't question the master uh that's the indian uh, ethos or whatever uh, that is the in, there's a way we uh, look at okay, the gurus. Sure. we don't question the gurus and the gurus uh, there's a wrong concept uh, of what a guru is. Guru uh, means the person who takes you or, or takes the darkness away from you. Okay, and one okay. thing great about the gurus, he never tells you everything. Okay, <laughs> so here we go. All yours and uh, welcome to the show of us. Is our show? Is not Doctor M show? Okay. So. Uh, all yours, Jeff. All yours. All right. Well, we thank you. Thank you for the introduction and to get to be on your show. Uh, you told me I could talk about anything, so that's going to be your fault. Okay. Accepted. <laughs> you, okay, accepted. I did want to talk in general about some of the history. Let's just say the worldwide quality movement, of course, very briefly, but uh, I became extremely attracted to that. I was, as you noted, I was a mechanical engineer trained in that. I loved that. Uh, my first work was with General Motors. Didn't care too much for that because I was interested in <clears throat> designing product. But I did get laid off in one of those automotive downturns and um, the very next Monday after being laid off on a Friday, I went down to GE. I had a recruiter, found me a job and I started to work at GE as a designer. And uh, now this was, uh, we were making gas turbines and still do, it's, a, it's really a wonderful business. But uh, <clears throat> I got exposed to something different uh, not too far into my work with GE, and it had to do with the quality movement. Mm. And uh, as a company, there were the leaders were more and more interested in in improving quality. But that was the big name; it was quality. And so, uh, <clears throat> one of my local managers wanted to try some of this in his area, and he knew from conversations I was interested in it, but that's that's kind of how it got started. <clears throat> so this would have been uh, 1980, late 1980s, uh, continuous improvement comes to town uh, at uh, at least our particular business in GE. It wasn't across all of GE. Well, I began to come across, I mean, the big names in that world and began to read about them. And here's what struck my heart there was that, okay, as a mechanical design engineer, I love that work. But in this world <clears throat> of improving quality, I could impact an entire business. I mean, it was for the first time I started to understand a few things about finances and how businesses make money 
all of that was very attractive to me. Uh, I was very attracted to the use of data, you know, that's so uh, important as you try to improve quality, things like that. So uh, I eventually got hired. I think it was a total quality advisor, and that was a full time role uh, helping being on the team for instituting continuous improvement. That was the official title. And that's a great title. <clears throat> and so I began to get exposed to names like Dr. W. Edwards Deming, and um, he was he was brilliant. I think I told you that I went to three of his four day seminars mm. <clears throat> in those years. And um, so those four days, uh, four day seminars that you used to conduct. Pardon? That was a four day seminars that Deming used to conduct. Four day seminars, yeah. And uh, my brother had had met Dr. Deming and I just reached out and called him one day. He was working for an automotive supplier mm. and he had read that paper about if Japan can, why can't we? Yeah. And this was a that's when the automotive industry was just starting to catch on. Uh, they moved much sooner than we did at GE on this. Um, but he began to tell me about it, and he invited me to come to the first one. And again, it was it was really amazing. I I don't know. He's probably maybe ninety years old at that time, yeah. and he's up on and he's teaching all day long, four days straight. Anyway, wonderful experiences, but. <clears throat> Back to uh, how we applied it, because I wanted to talk about what what was impressive about it, but it didn't last. And I know that's the theme of your show here. We did not sustain it. Uh, it didn't last. I want to talk about both the good and the bad there. And the same thing with Six Sigma. Uh, we were outstanding implementing Six Sigma. Uh, and of course, other GE folks would disagree with me, but I believe that. Um, Jeff, a question for you. Yeah. Uh, where did Duran come into play with Six Sigma? Good. Um, in continuous improvement, I didn't learn about Duran, mm. but later on, it was Michael Harry. Mm -hmm the uh, co-founder of Six Sigma that was greatly influenced by Joseph Duran, okay? And one of the, just a couple of things that impressed him was uh, Duran saw problems uh, as just something waiting for a project to be completed on it. He believed all improvement was done project by project. And that really impressed Dr. Harry. And then of course, it, um, Dr. Uh, Joseph Duran's uh, management thinking, you know, how you lead things and all, all of that greatly impressed Dr. Harry. And you'll see that <clears throat> in his present training, which still exists. You, you can see his references to Dr. Duran in that training. So there were other influences at that time on Dr. Harry. But that, that was a big one. And I believe I mentioned to you, from my perspective, Dr. Deming, uh, Michael wasn't very impressed with Dr. Deming, okay? Um, he liked Dr. Duran, okay? So Duran on Six Sigma, absolutely, because it impressed Dr. Harry very much, and he adopted a lot of those principles, yeah, okay. So anyway, uh, continuous improvement was excellent. We, we hired a, an outstanding consulting firm to come in and teach us. Um, one of the things it did not do, not that it can, it, just the way we did it, it did not do this. It did not, go yeah, ahead. Uh, sorry to interrupt you there. Yeah. When you say continuous improvement, because I want to differentiate that, uh, are we talking about lean management? Are we talking about Toyota production system? What 
is the title that is given for continuous improvement as you perceived it at that point of time? I would say it was mostly process improvement. Okay. Not title. We didn't know. Management we or, did not. Or Toyota. That? It was not titled as lean management or Toyota no. management. It was just called. No. Oh, okay. I get you. No. The title was continuous improvement. Hmm. Okay. So that was the name of it. But it was mostly about process improvement and, and making better use of data. Um, no, it, it's it's still an outstanding program. I'm I'm impressed with it. It was uh, company wide, very well organized, uh, top down, you know. Um, but but in my opinion, we dropped it because we weren't seeing the results. And I'm talking about dollars. Okay, I'm talking about improving metrics. Uh, so the operational performance, the financial performance, uh, we just didn't tie it in with that. Jeff, now, Jeff yeah. I want to paraphrase what I heard you say. Okay. I heard you saying that in GE, you ran this program uh, called uh, Continuous, Continuous Improvement. improvement which was process improvement, yes, right? But it did not have a subtitle or it did not have a tag of lean management system or it did not have a tag of Toyota production system. It only right. emphasized on process improvement using data or whatever it is. But yes, that title of lean or Toyota was not associated with continuous improvement process as nope. you adopted it. Am I no, right? we didn't know. We did not know about it. Thank you very much because I don't want, uh, I mean, I, uh, I mean, I, I was, because we normally associate continuous improvement, there are, we get lean into the picture, we get Toyota into the picture, but this was a simple, pure continuous improvement of processes. Yes. Yeah, thank you for clarifying that too, because in my mind, that's how I, when I hear that term, I know today it's very general, but in my early days, it was a very specific um, effort program, if you wish, uh, to improve operations. It was process improvement. Yep, very simple, and I love it. Uh, it ought to be done today, so it's good. All right. <clears throat> So as I was saying, we were talking about sustaining it. We had the organization infrastructure all set up to do that. But the big thing is, it's the same with Lean Six Sigma today, but the big thing was when we were doing those projects, uh, when we got improvements, we didn't bother to, to figure out how did it help the business. And you know, usually that's going to be in terms of finances. Ultimately, that's in terms of finances, and we didn't do anything with that. Um, so I remember this was a this was a shocker. And Jack Welch was the CEO at that time, uh, the chairman, and he didn't like continuous improvement. And you, you, this might be a shocker because later he was a champion of Six Sigma, of course. But he didn't want us going out to get data, <laughs> solving problems. And I'll never forget this. Um, I came into work one day and I was told, your job is gone. Uh, we're not going to have any more, uh, what do we call them, uh, total quality advisors. We're not going to have any more of those because we can't get if you guys can't make a decision quickly, you know, that was Jack's approach. Make these deci this, this, the, uh, decisions quickly. And we were gathering data in order to make, and he did not like that. And he axed the whole thing. Now, this wasn't across all of GE. This was just aircraft engines. Now, GE Aviation, you see. So, and things turned around completely later but that's one of the reasons he, he killed it. But in my opinion, we would have continued to do it 
if it was showing the value, if it was showing value to our to our leaders. Yes. Yes. Uh, even today, if any of the improvement processes, irrespective of what you title it, lean Toyota production system, whatever it is, unless the, the way I experience it, what I hear is, unless it converts or the owner or the whoever is running it does not see it in his bank. Yep. If he doesn't hear uh, the ruffle and shuffle and the noise made the coins and the dollars or the rupee in our system, he is not bothered. He, all, all what he is doing is that he wants cash in bank. The entire process is sell whatever you want to, but I want cash in my bank, not even check because right. check will bounce. Right. That's so right. Jack Wells was not different from what we have got enough Jack Wells now. They all want to hear the noise of the money. And they should. That's what they're paid for. <laughs> and as fast as possible. <laughs> yeah, as fast as possible. Yeah. Oh, no, you're you're right on target. But we didn't have those connections. Um, that's been corrected today, by the way, the way uh, I I would, you know, consult with it and whatnot. That's been corrected, but we did not have that. And so uh, it was gone. I still have all of the uh, notes and things, you know, from the training. Th these consultants, they were outstanding, outstanding. But uh, anyway, I think that's ultimately why it failed. Uh, but the other thing was <clears throat> it wasn't connected to financial performance but remember uh at that time jack welch was not a fan of the use of data uh to drive improvements and whatnot so that was that was also significant so, so i didn't so if i hear you right and if i'm relating it to the theme of uh our podcast is uh when the owner the leader whoever owns the business does not see uh, the cash uh, in his bank account where the throughput time is as low as possible by the time that he invests and he gets the ROI into his bank in cash. Right. And whatever his thought process is, whatever the leader's script is, or whatever his thought process is, if it does not match with the with any intervention that the other experts or the practitioners do, it may not sustain. It will not sustain. So if you want that magic pill for how to sustain this, at least part of that pill has to be, it has to deliver value. Now we normally measure that with dollars, currency of course, but it has to deliver value. That's the focus. It's really not even quality. Uh, that's just a means of, of delivering better value. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Okay. So that's that's what happened there. Uh, guys like me, there were there were a number of key leaders that recognized we should never have uh, given up on continuous improvement. I mean, it could look. The, the basics of this, it's like gravity. I mean, you don't get to argue that gravity does not work. You follow me? These principles work. If they don't work, it's, it's usually a leadership issue, okay? But they work. You don't get to say, oh, we tried lean and it didn't work. No, no, well, you can say that, but lean is not on trial. Uh, statistical process control, it's not on trial. These things have been vetted for decades, okay? So anyway, uh, I'll go on with that, but. Relief, relief, yes. relief, <laughs> thanks. Yes. Lee is not on trial, nor is statistical process control. Thank you very no. much. Yeah, not at all. Uh, so again, as a, as a consultant, that's why I prefer to work with the leaders, the C-suite, whatever you want to call them, 
And if they can't see that financial value, you should, you should not even start. Just don't waste your time, okay? Well, I'll talk about that some more later, but that's how CI got started. Uh, we had a lot of good talent around that. We did not sustain it, and we just talked about why that is, okay? So maybe I could jump forward a little bit sure. to the next major area of, of that history. But um, for a few years, I was um, kind of hiding. There were enough leaders that liked what I was doing. They didn't they didn't make me leave what I was doing. They found a way to kind of hide me in the organization. <clears throat> but then all of us, and then in the meantime, I wanted to get that master's in statistics because I saw the immense power of uh, data analysis mm -hmm. and process thinking. Uh, it is tremendous, and it is, of course, today as well. So in that little interlude, I went and got that master's in statistics. And uh, the, the state university was Miami University here near Cincinnati, Ohio. And the professors would come onto the GE campus and they would teach us. Uh, so anyway, that was going on. Well, again, I think most people know some of the history of GE and Six Sigma, but let's just say some of Jack Welch's colleagues convinced him that he ought to try this. And just as suddenly as I lost my position a few years earlier, I was given another one. And they said, you're going to be a master black belt. And here's your tickets. You're going to Crotonville. And Dr. Harry is going to teach you about Six Sigma, which I didn't know anything about. Yeah. Uh, so that was very exciting. But I was, uh, okay. I think I'm talking too much about that. Oh, you're but, talking on the right part because you just tempted me to ask you to send a ticket to me so that I can come and get from green belt to a black belt. You just tempted okay. me. Okay. Okay. We'll send you a ticket. That's right. That's right. Um, but I was resistant to Six Sigma. Honestly, Dr. Harry to me was very arrogant and not a likable person. <laughs> So this is no surprise to people that have been around that world, but he was brilliant. He, he was brilliant. And um, so we're sitting in that huge amphitheater at uh, GE Crotonville, you know, dozen people from every business in GE. And he's down in that pit and he's teaching everybody about Six Sigma. Um, so I think he sh I think he probably drove a lot of those vice presidents to just quit because they, <laughs> they had to, they had to get a laptop and learn how to use a laptop. So this was 95 or 96 and they don't you know they didn't know anything about laptops or data analysis or anything but they had to do it. They got stuck. So anyway, we started to do that and honestly I'm so I'm proud of this, not for myself, but from the leadership and whatnot at GE, at Aircraft Engines. And we, we really did it right. We followed Dr. Harry's plan for implementing this stuff. And we were, I mean, we did a shotgun blast of a start. So we got trained in the, in the new material and the next January, we started our first black belt class. And which so I was, was which year was this? 96. Right. 96 of January, we started our first black belt class. And I'm speaking for aviation now, not all of GE, but uh, everyone pretty much had to do that. Uh, but we did it. We did it. And um, we would we learned very quickly. I think this is a this is a big deal as well, just as far as principles that are you know success factors. Uh, we credit this to Jack Welch, but he decided that Six Sigma was leadership training. That that hadn't been thought of before, as, as I understand it, and so 
we did tremendous screening on these black belts that were going to come in for the training. So they picked their, you know, their high potential future leaders, the leaders that could go up two or three more levels. Those are the types of people that would come into that class. And they didn't know anything, you know, they don't know anything about this stuff. Didn't matter. They were from legal, they were from HR, you know, it doesn't matter what organ, they came in and they got whacked with this rigorous training. So it was quite a culture shock, you know. Yeah, but they were but, not carrying baggages. They just came totally empty. All the more reason. Yes. They, they absorbed oh, that's pressure. true. Yeah. I think I had some baggage, but they didn't, you know. Uh, but. I love teaching them. Uh, sometimes I taught with a partner who was just terrific. But uh, anyway, I want to talk about those finances again. So it didn't take us long at all to realize, oh, my goodness, this isn't just about quality. This is a moneymaker. And uh, for, for a few years, I would keep track by class, by a wave or a cohort, whatever you want to call it how much money the class saved and uh, how much per project and all that. And, and it was a lot. I think in our first year, because of all the startup, <clears throat> this is just memory, you know, it can be, I could mess this up, but I re remember a number like we lost 50 million in the first year. Because remember those projects aren't being completed immediately when you start it might take a few months before they get and then you don't get the full year savings you see but after that i mean it was double digit returns on what we spent on the program versus what we got back That's hundreds true. of millions hundreds of millions now oh i should put it in a context i think the revenue in those years for aircraft engines was maybe 15 billion or something like that. But we would get hundreds of million year after year on that. And why was that? Because those projects were aligned with financial goals that were, they were stretch goals. Wow. Um, I mean, I could talk about that, but, the, but based on what we were just talking about, they were aligned with financial performance. And we had, well, we had tremendous talent, but we had a chief financial officer who was tremendous. He, he realized pretty quickly, okay, this program is going to make my life a lot easier because you have, in any business, you have these headwinds that come up, you know, the resistance against your financial plan and all that you have those and and we knew by quickly because we were doing thousands of projects a year we knew quickly if we had a 250 million dollar hit this quarter we knew how many projects we needed to complete okay that that is close to a control function if you know what i'm saying the leaders can say okay we need an extra 200 million I know the button to push and we, we've proven that we can do this. I mean, it was, it still wasn't the best. I know we know a lot better now things to do, but I've never seen anything like that. And continuous improvement would not have done that as I, as I understood it at the time, this would not have done that. Okay. So that's some of the, the good experiences. Yeah. I mean, uh, And was that, yeah, I just uh, I just uh, paraphrase my understanding of what you said just now is that the entire goal that you had for the project and the process that you adopted at the Six Sigma that that was utilized had the end in mind was to get money into the organization. It didn't begin that way. Yeah, I think it was more of a quality focus. But we learned very quickly 
that is a cash cow, you might say. Yeah. But I just want to uh, expand it a little more because yeah. uh, I personally, I don't think there's anything wrong in making money. You may have yeah. many philosophies, but if an organization makes money, it has its own spread across the community, across the country, and what have you. And I mean, I'm too small to, to talk about all this. I, uh, I will uh, use your shoulder to shoot for up. Is that okay. you reinvest this money and you get into higher technologies and greater growth and then the greater kindness to the humanity per se. Yes. And what's wrong with making money then? Yes. Well, you can't help you can't help someone if you don't have anything to give. So, but I, in that, along those lines, talking about community responsibilities, social responsibilities and whatnot, that is all very important. But I believe, I don't, I don't think a company can do anything better than this for a community. And that is to provide a job. If a company can provide a job, that is an enormous blessing for a community. So you, you have to be able to have some margin. You know, you got to have some profit. And if you, you've got the right people in place, just like you said, they, they will reinvest it. And the blessings from that are enormous. Yeah. So I'm right there with you. Very important. Dr. Deming used to say, don't think that it's the poor performing companies that need what he, Dr. Deming, is teaching. The greater responsibility is with the successful companies. They're the ones that need it the most for reasons we were just talking about. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So anyway, that, uh, that happened. And it was an exciting time. We were generating leaders. <clears throat> Our leaders were being picked off by other uh, divisions, if I could say that, of GE, you know, to go help them. Because Six Sigma, I really think more of it, it's, it's, a, it's a management system, okay, for the uh, watching over the financial performance of a business. That's primarily how I see it. And when these leaders, know how to do what I was describing, uh, like go into the operations and improve them uh, through this approach, this management system, they make excellent leaders. So they would go to places like 3M, they would go to the Boeing company and you know, they, would, they were being picked off and going to these other areas. And then within, within our group, uh, the aircraft engines, uh, you could tell pretty quickly if this person had been trained in Six Sigma principles, you know, along with all the others. It's not just that, but just to add this to their skill set, they would lead that way. They would lead in the terms of process thinking, making decisions with data, tie projects uh, to your goals and, you know, that sort of stuff. So a big, a big uh, emphasis on Six Sigma as a management system. And of course, everything I'm saying here applies to lean as well. And it's the same. These are principles that have to be accomplished, whatever you're doing. You know, it doesn't matter. So, okay. Well, we uh, had a good run on that. Uh, Jack Welch retired. The, the new chairman wasn't that uh, interested in, in Six Sigma. Remember, not all of GE enjoyed this kind of success. There was there were still businesses that they didn't want it. I mean, they kind of had to do it, but they didn't want it, okay? Um, but at any rate, uh, we got a new chairman and wasn't very interested in Six Sigma. And uh, I felt that almost immediately because with Welch, I mean, you think about this. He tied, um, it was either 40 or 60% of your, of the executives, 
you know, bonus money to meeting Six Sigma goals. Now, he did that immediately, okay, when we started to launch this. So he knew right away you had to have those leaders in place, and he gave them a, a carrot, okay? And that was your executive compensation, your bonus money is heavily tied into meeting these Six Sigma goals, you know, and, and it worked. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't take a genius to know that that's a motivation. So he had a carrot and he also had a stick because I remember there was a VP or two that uh, kind of spoke out against it. That we don't need this and uh, they retired, okay? <laughs> So, again, this is my feeble memory, but uh, I, I was there, you know, learning all these things of how it was happening. Well, so it started to deteriorate, and we still trained a lot of folks, but some things began to fall away. Uh, I think uh, after a few years, we began to um, maybe back off on the strict requirements to enter the program. Uh, I think I felt that I could, you can see that in the class. Uh, we, we stopped, we began to at least began to stop showing those financials and the, the rigorous uh, uh, reviews and things on the financials from Six Sigma coming out. Uh, we even began to talk about not tracking the financials anymore. You see, you can you see how it's starting to deteriorate yeah, very quickly? Uh, the major link or the umbilical cord that you had with uh, the process, the tool being Six Sigma to deliver the, the uh, finances of an organization. As I hear you say, the umbilical cord started snapping and there yes. was not that sort of a correlation drawn uh, between yeah. the efforts put in and the revenue coming in. Uh, I yes. You right? Yes. Yes. And to that point, thank you for that. Uh, we did some things wrong in those early years, and this helped, contributed to lack of sustaining it. Now, I'm, I'm exaggerating, but it's just, it's just to try to make the point. That's right. Um, we tried to make every problem a Six Sigma problem with the full rigor of Six Sigma. That was a mistake. Uh, Dr. Harry didn't even teach that. So we were, anyway, that frustrated people. It sounds like, uh, you know, uh, th there's a saying that we all say, uh, for a hammer, everything is a nail. Yes. Right? Yes. Okay. Yeah. But you see, it was such a heavy top-down approach. Every salaried person had to become a green belt, mm. had to do a project. Now think about that. In some of those years, we were doing 15, 16,000 projects a year. Now, were all of those value-added projects? So think about you had, to, you had to complete a project to be certified as a green belt, okay? Every salaried person. Now, do you think all of those... Yeah, go ahead. So, I'm sorry, what I hear you saying is that it had become practically a ritual. Okay, yeah. Yeah, uh, like, uh, I mean, uh, sorry for this. Uh, for example, uh, I say my prayers every night before I go to sleep, right? But... yeah. Honestly, when I pray, I just utter things without even remembering which deity I'm praying to. So it becomes Understood. a ritual, a habit, but then not significant for, for me. I'm talking about my prayers. Yeah, yeah. It doesn't add value to me at all. I mean, I'm not, I'm just saying it because I had to say it. Yeah. I'm sorry yeah. to disrupt it. It's just thought that occurred to me. I'm no, not, that's okay. I, I, bl bl blame I it, love it. Blame it of <laughs> lack of turf on my head. <laughs> Sorry for that. Okay. But at any rate, that was something that 
had hurt us and it gave a bad reputation. Oh, and here's a couple other things. I think this is, this is good uh, history for your viewers, but uh, the financial savings were overestimated. Now that you're losing credibility when you claim savings that are not really realistic. Okay. Uh, so some of that rigor began to fall away, meaning we used to have um, finance very much involved in making sure these savings are ones that will, will go to the bottom line on the income statement. You see that that rigor is so critical. And then see, we, we were starting to lose that discipline. So not everything is a nail. Uh, the finances, people are starting to, to distrust the financial savings. You see the deterioration coming in? Yeah. You don't have the 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 chief, the chairman, uh, not that uh, interested in Six Sigma. These things are starting to happen. Now, who who else sees these things? Well, middle middle managers see these things. The top managers see these things, and they realize, you know, they need to be aligned with with the top. Yep. They don't have to necessarily be aligned anymore. Okay. So, so sorry. So the stretch target initially, which was started by Jack Welch, was linked towards the bottom line and the finance. What I hear you yes. saying now is there is a little bit of disconnect between the stretch goals. Maybe it was not aligned or uh, directed towards the revenue part of it. Am I right in capturing what you said? That's right. It it. Over time, it deteriorated like that, yes. And then, of course, people don't want to become Six Sigma trained anymore because it used to be a ticket to promotion. You follow me? Yeah. It was, our, it was the leadership program. So all those beautiful things, you know, um, I guess we, we didn't do enough risk management on, this, on what really – needs to happen to sustain it okay uh but i mean just some lessons learned for your viewers on some things that happened there and then um it did deteriorate and <clears throat> i could feel it immediately so i went from this is just me personally from just being extremely thankful to be a part of, of such an effective program like that to where now I was part of something that uh, was looked on as really not very important. And uh, so those were in some of my very last years there at GE and I took an early retirement, okay? And that was one of the reasons I left a little earlier, okay? Um, didn't really have any other contact with Dr. Harry or anything. So <clears throat> I'm just, going to go to the next step here and uh, I'm probably more excited now than I've ever been about the future of this and that's because um, I think the year after I retired Dr. Harry contacted me and wanted me to uh, come to Arizona and get trained as the executive master black belt that you had mentioned. Uh, and of course, I was ecstatic. Um, so I had to pay for all that myself. You know, that wasn't GE anymore. <laughs> I wasn't ecstatic about that. But yeah, I went out to Arizona. This was to be to teach, you, you know, most master black belts are, they typically, typically, are not so much leadership, but technically oriented. You follow me? Experts in the tools and all that. Okay. Uh, we did not do that at aircraft engines. We didn't try to make them technical experts. We wanted to make them leaders. But at any rate, Dr. Harry was teaching how to work with the C-suite when you are deploying, well, we were calling it, we and still do, Lean Six Sigma at that time. How do you work with the C-suite. So I went to that 
and they don't he only allowed four in the class at a time there were just four of us i just it was you know compared to a few hundred at the classes in crotonville that he taught this was four people <laughs> And they're vetted, you know, you can't just sign up online, if you know what I mean. So I got to hear him, and he he was essentially teaching us all about how he did these deployments. You know, he, he was the guy, I know he had other people, but, you know, Ford Motor Company, um, I was just trying to think of some of these. Well, DuPont, of course, was huge. GE was huge. That's the kind of companies he was working with. And he had all of this knowledge on how to make this stuff work. And he was just giving that out. I mean, it was, it was an opportunity of a lifetime, seriously. So uh, shortly after that, he, he had recognized that Six Sigma, now I'm going to go back just to that topic, was being diluted. It's been true for years and years. The rigor of Six Sigma has been diluted. Uh, companies that have tried it, very few were successful because the, you know, the original body of knowledge was being uh, compromised. Uh, that the time to do the training was cut in half. All of these things were diluting or polluting Six Sigma. Michael saw that and he wanted to reverse that. It and that's why he right? started. What? It became absolutely commercial the way it is today. Absolutely oh, commercial. Thank you. Yeah. So you have the, this is not all consultants, but uh consultants would dilute it because their clients didn't want the rigor they wanted the results they did not want the rigor and the consultants accommodated that does that make sense it does make sense it makes sense and so that's what he's seen so he wanted to he wanted to build up about a hundred of these executive master black belts around the world to carry on the proper rigor the proper dna whatever you want to call it of six sigma uh i knew that and obviously i was there i wanted to do that uh so again things that we did at ge he wouldn't do today even though they were very successful there's there are better ways to do that today and um i don't know maybe i could talk a little bit about that sure yeah Yep. Okay. Um, just a, a couple of comments. Uh, I think the two main competitors we would agree in business improvement, operational excellence, whatever, the two main competing methodologies are Lean and Six Sigma. And I do know that they compete. I'm not naive. Okay. But when you say you want Lean Six Sigma, this is probably what will happen. And, and I, I've learned so much in these last very few years from um, Alan LeDuc, who has taken over the, the, um, the thinking of Dr. Harry and trying to preserve that thinking. Okay. So, Doc, so um, Alan LeDuc, so I work with Alan. But uh, I forgot what I was saying. What was my last point before I yeah, uh, mentioned? What, uh, what you were saying was that uh, you wanted to uh, continue and tell us the episodes about, uh, you know, after Harry, and then you started working for Alan and- uh, okay. Okay. The change in the Six Sigma concepts. And you also emphasize okay. that you wanted to have a, it's, is it okay to say a pedigree that will carry the DNA forward of Six Sigma? Okay. 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 I like that. I like that. I'm with you. I was starting to say that if you teach Lean Six Sigma, this is just typ typically what happens. And again, I was giving credit to Alan for this. 
you are going to emphasize one or the other. That's just the way it is. And so if you're a Gimba guy like you, you would emphasize the lean aspect. A, a geek like me, I'm going to be emphasizing the Six Sigma aspect. Okay, I'm just uh, confessing my bias. But I believe since Six Sigma is ultimately a management system, uh, the way we see it, it is the umbrella. And you bring anything into that umbrella you want because it's a management system. Yep. Okay. You bring whatever you want. There's new stuff comes up all the time. Fine. It has to be organized. It has to come under an effective management system if it's ever going to work. So I don't care. Go. Sorry, Jeff. And yeah. thanks for that point. Because, yeah, a Gemba guy like me, we've got pet theories, right? I call it yeah. pet theories. Pet okay. theories, according to me, a Gemba guy says, if it is not done in Gemba, Six Sigma is only for projects and lead looks after the Gemba. Okay. Yeah. Now, the Six Sigma guys would say, hey, that's not what it is. Projects are more important and what we tell you, you do it. And we counter it by saying, the operators don't know what you're doing. So who produces the values? The operators. And what the hell are you doing in your AC room playing around with mini tabs? It doesn't bother me yeah. at all. We can do whatever we want, even without a control panel. You yeah. keep doing well, those words, system. those words just hurt. You just hurt me right there. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, with the Gemba guy. No, no. Let but me, it's true. Please, what you said is true. Please, yeah. please, here I will get the piece of the pigeon. The pigeon doesn't know which wing <laughs> is enabling it to fly, whether it is a lean or the six sigma, it flies. Yeah. Does it attribute to the left wing or the right wing? Right. It's a management system, as you said. I'm in, I'm game with you. Yeah, yeah. It is. And the management system. I think of is so the reason it's so powerful. I don't. Did you say I could share my screen? Did you say that? Yeah, you're free, sir. Yes. Okay. I'm going to draw a little picture here. So bear with me. This is going to be risky now because <laughs> I'm not an artist, but I think this is, this is important. So I'm going to share my screen right now. Uh, you advocated taking risk. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So I'm just going to do a uh, a little sketching. Uh, I'm probably in the middle of the camera here, but I'm just going to do a little sketch. Okay. Okay. So this is a big deal. Uh, it it's not a different. It's not a uh, unique concept at all. But I want to show you, this is an example of when I say it's a management system. Now, okay, I'm just going to go, go ahead and do this. We have the business level, the operational level in a business, of course, and then the process level. This has got nothing to do with the organizational hierarchy. The triangle... What's that? The triangle does not have to do with the... Uh, the organizational hierarchy. Well, in, in a sense, it is because yep. your C-suite's up here. And, okay. But this is, these anyway, what I'm saying is at the business level, you measure things like, um, you know, earnings before interest in taxes. You do, you do market share. Uh, you do net income, you know, high level business metrics. Now this is, I'm just talking about a system of management. Okay. At the operational level, you might have uh, inventory turns. You might have on-time delivery. You might have yield, uh, yep. things like this. At the yep. process level, much more specific metrics. Yep. You know, in the CP, CPK, yep. uh, defects per unit, these types of things. Yep. But 
the management system, and every every company does this, but but what's different is we're trying to to get a correlation among the metrics that are used within okay. the business. So if you let's say a business wants to focus on cash, I was just with a client this week. Cash, well, it's always a that's always huge, but let's say you want to focus on cash. Then with this system, you want to come down into operations, and it's always a matter of focus. A folk, where would I focus to impact cash? Well, let's say someone someone believes, well, uh, it's yield, or uh, let, let's instead of yield, let's do some. It's on time delivery. Mm. Gosh, if I could just deliver these these products on time, I I would gain more revenue, and if and if I could improve the yield, of course, uh, your costs course. go way down. Yeah. So, but then what you're going to do? Which processes now do you need? Which processes? Well, maybe it's a maybe it's a machining process. Maybe it's uh, the way you you process your quotes maybe it's accounts receivable i don't know but these are processes so what should we focus on in order to you know correlate all the way back up into your strategy now i know you got whole yeah, yeah, planning yeah, i know yeah, you yeah, got go yeah, ahead yeah, 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 yeah. sorry sorry let yeah. me paraphrase what you said so yeah. the starting point is you start at the business level okay and I'm just narrating what I heard you saying. So check me yep. out anytime. So start yep. at the business level, check what the customer wants, then take that uh, parameter, link it. How do I make that successful at the operation level? It could be any of uh, the three that you've said, inventory churn, uh, delivery, or yield. Yep. Once you stick to one or a combination of that, then you come down to stick which are the processes that is going to enhance or in, enhance uh, the lead, uh, yield, reduce the delivery type, and then you link it up, saying that this is what the customer wants. So it is, it is uh, I mean, right from top, right to the process that you select. Am I right, sir? Yes, you are correct. And I, and I know we think that way logically, yeah. but I'm talking about metrics. Yeah. I, you always have metrics at the business level because you measure the stuff that's important. Mm. You have to have, but it breaks down when you go into operations process, it breaks, they have measurements too, but the linkage is what breaks down. You yes. got it? Yes. This is, this is huge. We were not taught that. Uh, this is a different generation of, of Six Sigma, what I'm talking about here. This is what we're now doing, okay? Uh, it's just one thing. Now, now, please, I know this isn't, this is not innovate. I, I know that. We're just talking about recognizing the power of having this control function that, that we just described. Imagine a C-suite that understands this control function, what they could do for the financial performance of the business. And it may not, I mean, anything you wanted to do, it doesn't have to be financial performance, but companies need to do other things. But that's management system. And I'm saying to you, you put any of these methodologies, Lean Six Sigma, whatever, you just put them into that management system and they're going to work. You see my point? They're going to work. Go. Jeff, at this point, I uh, have a request to make. Yeah. I want you to deep dive into this particular diagram that you have driven and uh, what you have been telling me. Can we dedicate an episode only on this? And this just occurred to me. So that, you know, uh, we become, we take a, because this makes a lot of sense. And this is what the community requires. And if time permitting, if you can give me one episode so that we can deep dive into this. 
Is that okay with you? Prime oh, that's fine. I have not. I have not. That's take, fine. I am not taking it as a commitment. I am taking it as a promise. That's all. You can. You. Okay. I know you will. You won't break it. But I like this, and this is what we want to hear. Yeah. Well, again, um, your original purpose. Yep. How do you sustain it? If you don't have that management system I mean, yeah. we're talking about, you're not going to sustain it. I believe this is true, that the vast majority of lean impl implementations, Six Sigma implementations fail. Okay. I know you can train the content, you know, the training and the content, that's solid. They don't have a management system. And Six Sigma provides that. Now, I'm sure there's, you have something equivalent in lean, but this is the one I know. This is the one I experienced, and it is powerful. Okay. Sure. All right. Uh, yeah, we can do that. We can look at that. Oh, I wanted yes. to say another yeah, thing yeah. to you. Please. Please. Uh, the quality world for most of most of my career in it, it's always focused on the customer. Uh, there's problems with that. Uh, you say, well, how can that be? How could it, you got to focus on the customer. Yeah, yeah, but you got to make money when you're trying to please that customer. So Dr. Harry came up with what I think is a fantastic definition of quality and I can't quote it ver verbatim here, but um, it's basically this. Quality is a state in which the provider and the customer realize their value expectations, okay, or entitlement in every relationship uh, between the two, okay? Did you see the difference is you have to focus on the provider. I know sometimes that's all the focus is, is on the provider. We know that's wrong. There's a reason you've heard focus on the customer, but we're not hearing focusing on both very often. And I love that definition of quality. Very healthy. Yeah. Okay. What I hear you say, what I hear you say, is uh, in my terminology is that there has to be a excellent balance between the voice of the customer and the voice of the business. Yes. Both have to have an equal weightage and both have to have a win-win situation. I'm sorry I'm using this cliche of win-win, etc. But that has the both has to have the right balance. That's what I hear yes. you saying. I mean, that's what is in my head. I mean, I hope uh, I'm right yeah. in interpreting you. No, you're right. Um, my wife and I were just on some Uber rides uh, on this uh, business trip I mentioned. And I thought it was extremely valuable that not only does the, the customer, the person in the back seat, they get to comment or rate the driver okay now but the driver also gets to rate the passenger that's very healthy when you think when i think about just services like okay we're on the airplane i mean think about those flight attendants uh, they're trying to be so nice to you and some of them get treated like dirt <laughs> It's, it's kind of sad, but it's both ways. So in the service industry, they try so hard, okay, so hard to please the customer. But uh, remember, the customer has their part to do as well. So anyway, it's two-way street. Okay, those are some highlights. Great, great. I think... Uh... I like the way you do this. I, I'll try uh, doing uh, doing this artistic work sometime. 
Yeah. Uh, well, I'm embarrassed about my pictures. No, it's looking good. They're good enough. They're good, good. enough. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think uh, you can share the screen now. You can stop sharing your screen so that. Ah, there you go. So uh, just give me a second. Good. Uh, we talked about, uh, we learned actually, uh, I learned everything from the journey that you had. All what you said was your experiences of your experience with General Motors, with GE, of the continuous improvement and, and then the emphasis on Six Sigma. And then to understand that yes, leadership matters, you told me about how the stress goals have to be aligned with the value, what Jack Wells had said, that money matters. And then we heard how the continuous improvement processes did go flatlined because some other yeah. concept came, which was also <laughs> extremely good. That also took a little bit of a hit. It got diluted because the rigor was not there. And the emphasis that you gave, and check me out, and you are you have the last word, is that any system, if it sticks to its basics and is rigorously implemented, will deliver. Am I it right? will deliver, yes. It will. The last word, sir. And you made a promise we are going to do another episode on the beautiful triangle that you drew. <laughs> Well, I'm going to practice that triangle for hours before we do it again, <laughs> drawing the triangle. Yeah. But no, uh, you, you made a good summary there. And I believe that uh, some of the simplest, uh, even just simple problem solving, uh, you know, at the elementary level that anyone can use, if you put that inside of that management system, you're going to win. And of course, not all problems uh, can be easily solved. So you, you increase the training, you know, so, and there's different types of uh, problems. So lean is going to address things far, far better than Six Sigma could. It depends on the, the nature of the project and the, and the goal. Uh, so if it has to do with speed, I'm not going to use Six Sigma for speed. I'm going to use Lean, okay? You Sorry don't, for my humor, just... Jeff. Sorry for my humor, Jeff. Sorry for my okay. humor, Jeff. I mean, I, yeah. it's, it's, you're so, I mean, you hit, I mean, you're, you said it so well. I mean, you don't expect a dentist to deliver a child. No. <laughs> <laughs> No, I, I've never even thought about that. No, because everything, I mean, you use the right approach for the problem that you're tackling. And that's yeah. where I come from. You should have a good knowledge or sufficient knowledge at, and Deming, sorry to use Deming again, but I love that guy. Yeah. Deming says you need to have a working knowledge of, of many things. You don't have to be an expert. Now, if you are dealing with certain things that require a Six Sigma, get an expert and do the Six Sigma part of it. Why are you want to try? Yeah. If you want yeah. a, a Gemba expert, come on, get a Gemba expert. But you should know where to get whom. And yeah, why criticize right. people? Sorry right. for that. You say the good words. No, that's good. It's just like the, I, I got to stop. I know that. But it's just sure. like, it's not about those tools. Okay, we all know that, uh, but you bump that up to the next level. It's not about those methodologies either. You follow me? It's yeah. not about the methodologies. You don't focus on those. You focus on that management system to drive the, the health of that business. And the blessings that come out of the health of a business are enormous. So I'll shut up, but that's, that's where we are. No, you are going to take a pause at this point of time and you start speaking in our next episode with a beautiful drawing as usual. I'm stop recording. Nice to have you around and uh, I'm looking forward to the next episode and I'm going to harass you till I get you back on my, with your beautiful drawing. Don't practice your drawing, please. Here I <laughs> <laughs>